Well, good morning again, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you. And the sun actually is now shining through my lounge windows. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I'm so looking forward. I can't wait to see you all in person. Um, some of you who know me well will know that uh, I love the four walls of my home, but I have been climbing them this week uh, at various times, although I'm pleased to say I am managing my frustration about still being confined to my lovely home uh, better at this end of the week than I was uh, at the beginning of the week. We're continuing in our series this morning uh, on Philippians. Uh, if, you've, if you're joining us for the first time uh, this morning, we've been uh, working our way through Philippians, a letter from Paul's lockdown to us. And I know God has been speaking to us. I know we've been unpacking it in greater detail in our life groups. And I hope you'll continue to unpack chapter three, which is where our reading came from today. I hope you'll continue to unpack that with your, your friends and your life groups uh, this week. Uh, we'll come back to the passage in a moment, but I want to ask you um, a question before we do, and it's this. What have you found yourself dreaming about or longing for in these last few weeks? I know we're all in very different setups. We're confined to different kinds of barracks. Our circumstances are different. But I know that we're human and drastic changes in circumstances and prospects like we've been um, thinking or like we've had at the moment, like we're exposed to at the moment and an uncertain future ahead of us. These kind of things have the habit of making us think about our lives and think about all kinds of things, think about what matters to us, what doesn't matter to us, what we need to live, what we could do without. And I wonder in the context of all of that, what you found yourself thinking about or longing for in um, these recent weeks. I'm sure there will have been the obvious stuff like longing for a great coffee or longing for your favorite takeaway or longing to be able to have a meal out or longing to watch live sport if you're a member of this household, although I'm not speaking for myself. Uh, maybe you're longing for a good haircut as my men are. Maybe you're longing for just any kind of haircut. Uh, we were dreaming about holidays this week, where we might go, when we might go, whether uh, actually it's even going to be a reality that we can have a holiday this year. And of course, there's the obvious longing that I know that we'll all share of being able to meet up with friends and family again. And I know that, of course, there are always the other longings that we live with, longing for a baby, longing to get well, longing to see uh, someone we love get well, longing to get a job, longing to get a new job, longing to find a relationship. Longing is part of the human condition because it's connected to desire and desire is part of who we are. It's how God's made us. But I think seasons like the season that we're in at the moment, when some of the kind of noise of life dies down and gets stripped back, it often puts us more in touch with uh, some of our deeper longings. Uh, and I think sometimes it even causes new longings to emerge. And in this chapter uh, three of Philippians that we're looking at uh, at the moment, and this chapter that we're looking at this morning, where this uh, reading came from, um, Bruce and Sue read verses 10 to 17 in the message version, Paul puts his greatest longing on paper. Remember, he's in prison too. He's in lockdown. He's deprived of all kinds of privileges and freedoms. And he actually has no idea. We've got some kind of clue about what might be coming next, the next stage. He's got no idea about how long he'll, he's in there and whether he'll actually get out. But in the midst of this, uh, in the midst of it, he writes this. And you might want to have uh, your Bible open. He said, uh, Bruce and Sue read, I'm reaching out for Jesus. And in the NIV, it says, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection. That's the longing that he writes in the center of this chapter. Not, I'm longing to get out of here. Not, I'm longing for some really decent food and a bath and a comfortable bed. Not, I want to continue uh, traveling the world. Not even, I want to be useful in this world. Not even, I want to be, I'm longing to be reunited with the people I love but I want to know Jesus. I want to know his power. I want to know him even if I have to suffer to know him. And I want to know this resurrection that he talks about. That's top of the list of his longings to know Jesus better, which is maybe one of the reasons that he was in phased, uh, unfazed about being in lockdown, because I think it's, it's one of the only longings, maybe the only one, that can be fulfilled in every circumstance that we find ourselves in. You know, if we're in a sick body or if we're trapped in a, a prison or anywhere in between, whatever situation, nothing can prevent us from knowing 
Jesus better. And he's saying, you know what? I'm in prison, I'm in isolation, but it hasn't changed my greatest longing. I want to know him better. I'm reaching out. I'm still reaching out after him. There's this fire of desire in Paul, burning for Jesus in his heart. And his isolation and his imprisonment has, have only intensified it. We have a fireplace in our lounge and we were sitting in here on Monday evening. I don't know if you remember as far back as Monday, but it was pretty cold. It was really cold in our vicarage. It takes quite a long time to heat up. And we thought we need a fire. And then we realized that we had no wood. So we just had to wrap ourselves in blankets and rugs and shiver our way through the evening. But fires produce a huge amount of heat, don't they? And a huge amount of energy, even in freezing conditions when there's nothing else, there's no other source of heat around. And Paul's got this fire of desire going on in his heart to know Jesus. And it doesn't matter what the conditions are around him, how cold they are. And he's not saying, I want to know him in theory. I just wish somebody could deliver me some concordances. I'm looking for some academic information that will help me get my head around the kingdom and equip me with more facts about Jesus. He's saying, I want to know him through my personal experience of him in everyday life. This word know that is used in the text is a word for knowing intimately. It's the word the Bible used uh, about a, a man knowing his wife, a wife knowing her husband. He's, he's talking about wanting a closer connection with Jesus. He wants to know Jesus as the living, present, kind friend that he is. He's wanting to know Jesus more as the compassionate, courageous, rescuer and radical life changer that he is. And he's wanting more of God's touch, more of God's power on his own life. Paul knew that the power that raised Jesus from the dead wasn't just in, in evidence and at work in, in that moment in history, but it's the power, is a power that Jesus makes available to all of us every day to know him, to know his love, to live radically different lives and to minister that power to other people. And, and Paul's saying, I want more of it. I want more of Jesus. I want more of his power. I want more of his life. I want more of his love. And he's also saying, I don't care what it costs me. I don't care what it costs me. Notice he says in, in verse uh, 13 about I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. He's saying, do you know what? If suffering and pain makes me more open to knowing him or more desperate for his presence or more aware of how much I need him or more open to his touch on my life or, or more open to learning his ways and, and letting go of mine, if it helps me to experience more of Jesus and his love and his life, then I'm good with that. That's what he's saying. I'm good with it. It's a price worth paying. I don't know how you would respond to this. I don't know how you respond to what Paul's saying. I'm sure some of those original readers in Philippi would have wondered whether Paul had kind of lost the plot. You know, I wonder if they had kind of thought as they read this, Paul, chill out, you're sounding a bit obsessive. But you know what, friends? I think the reality is that we're all obsessed with something. I think we all have a top goal in life. And for me, when I read this and I listen to these words that we've read, I think, I find myself thinking as I've read this passage this week, do you know what, Paul, you inspire me. Your ambition for knowing Jesus better, for knowing more of him, it challenges me. It inspires me. You inspire me and your, your fire challenges me. And deep within me, there's this cry too of, yes, I want to know him better. Because every time I see him, every time I experience his touch on my life, every time I see and sense his goodness uh, in my life or the lives of others, every time I discover more of his heart for me and his heart for his world, it's like a, a kind of piece of bacon being wafted under my nose and I want more. I want more and I go, yeah, I want to know him better. But then there's this battle and my flesh replies, mm, but I want everything else as well. I don't know if I want to pay the cost. I don't, I don't know if I want it. I don't, I don't know if I want to run after Jesus in, in the same way and in the costly way that Paul's talking about. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 30, 13. If you've got your Bible open, Paul says, I'm going after this one thing. I'm running after him. I'm going to forget what's behind. I'm going after him. And he's not suggesting here that we should neglect everything else in life. He's not suggesting that nothing else is important. It's good and it's right to have the dreams and desires and the ambitions for our relationships or our marriages or our families or our 
careers or our workplaces or our communities. It's right to be involved in the good causes that we're involved in, to dream for our nation and have ambition for our friends to know him. They're great desires and they're great dreams. And so often they've been planted in our hearts by God himself. But what Paul is implying is that if they come in second place, if they don't come in second place to our ambition to knowing Jesus better, guess what? We will end up using Jesus. We will end up using the Father to help us go after these other dreams and desires that we have. And if he doesn't fulfill them in the way that we're longing for, in the way that we're hoping for, we're likely to become resentful or feel let down, which will end up pushing us further away from him. Look at verse 17. Paul says, stick with me, friends. Come on, join with me in following my example. So maybe the question to ask ourselves this morning, to allow God to ask us is, do we need a reset on our ambitions? Do we need a reset on our kind of top goal? I know we've all got goals. We've all got dreams and desires and ambitions. But what's top of your list, friends? What's top of your list, friends? Let's make sure. Let's allow Paul to encourage us to make sure again this morning that we're going after Jesus first. And Jesus says, if we seek first his kingdom, do you know what? We get everything else as well. C.S. Lewis said this, put first things first and we get second, second things thrown in. Put second things first and we lose both first and second things. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying to us, come on, join in, follow my example. So question, how do we do that? Well, that's something I think, you know, maybe would be really good to explore further in um, our groups together, our times together online this week. But Paul here is using the analogy of a race, isn't he? He uses words like running and I'm pressing on towards a prize and pressing on towards a goal. And he's not like using the analogy to sort of as a training metaphor, but it actually as a running in a race metaphor, like going after Jesus is like running in a race, which hasn't finished yet. And crossing that line is when we die and are, and are welcomed by him into eternity. Now, you, those of you who know me well will know that I have an allergy to running. It brings me out in a rash. But luckily, I live with a load of runners in my own home. And so I have a bit of intel on what's needed when you are running a long race. My amazing husband, many of you will know, he ran at the London Marathon a few years ago. And so using Paul's metaphor of running a race, here are just three brief headlines about how we can um, make sure that we are in a position where that fire is burning or where it's being stoked if it's not burning and where we can join in with Paul in running this race. Firstly, we need to be quick and to be good at editing our lives. I need to edit my life if I'm going to stay in my lane and keep running this race. He uses, or the writer of the Hebrews uses the running uh, metaphor in the book of Hebrews as well. And uh, the writer of Hebrews says this, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles us. And let's run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Talks about throwing off what slows us down and holds us back. Tim if Tim had tried running the marathon uh, in his robes or in his kind of winter kit with his heavy shoes on and his, his puffer jacket and everything else, it would have slowed him down. It would have absolutely defeated his chances before he'd even started. And Paul's saying to us, or you know, the writer of the Hebrews is saying, let's get rid of the stuff that's going to make it hard for us to run after Jesus with everything we've got. What holds you back? Do you know what holds you back? Do you think about the kind of things that hold you back? You know, maybe it would be good in this in this remaining lockdown time to kind of do a bit of an edit of our lives. What relationships are holding us back? Think about the things that the distractions that might hold us back, the habits and the mindsets that pull us away from God. Maybe we're too attached to the past and the old way of normal. Let's do an inventory, friends, of, of what we're carrying. And ask God to show us what of these do we need to throw off or let go of so that we can go after him and allow that fire to burn brightly in our hearts. What's stopping you praying or spending time with him? What's stopping me uh, from going after him? Do I need to throw off the duvet? Do I need to throw off Netflix? Do I need to throw off the need for answers? Do I need to throw off some competing ambitions? 
You know, we've each got one race. God's got one race for us to run. Somebody else can't run it for me and they can't run it for me, uh, for you. You know, if we're taking the fire analogy, a fire's going to go out if it's just left to its own devices. What's holding us back? So, so let's edit our lives. Secondly, let's check our team. Let's check our team. The first thing Tim knew that he was going to need to do if he was going to cross the finishing line in the London Marathon was to get a team together to encourage him and cheer him on. And of course, you know, we the family were those members and we ended up in London and we had this plan with some friends of ours about getting to the different slots, uh, spots along the race where we could cheer him on. And there were obviously more significant spots than others when he was tiring and he was struggling. And uh, it was a privilege to be part actually of that team cheering him on. Who's your team? that's going to cheer you on in this race? Who are the people around you that are going to continue to stir up that fire in you, to stir up your hunger, to cheer you on, to go after Jesus when actually maybe some of the stuff that you're facing or struggling with is pulling you back? You know, have you got people in your team, as it were, that are hungry for him themselves, that want to run after him themselves? If you've got people who are praying for you and with you, to help you to keep running in this race? Do you read the stories of other Christians who've gone before you that inspire you? We were talking in our family this week just about some of the incredible biographies that are out there of people that have run this race and crossed that finishing line with that fire of desire still burning in their hearts. Do you know what, friends? We can't borrow someone else's passion. We can't borrow someone else's personal experience of Jesus. We can't borrow someone else's fire but we can uh, make sure that we have a team to help us stoke our own fire of desire to put those logs on and to encourage us to do what we need to do to keep that fire burning. Who's in your team, friend? Who's in your team? And then lastly, when it's hard, you know, there's points of a race where we hit the wall. I mean, not that I'm speaking from experience, but from other people's experience, there's, there's a wall, isn't there? Or there's a number of walls. We need our team to cheer us on. But when it's really hard, we need to remember the reward. Paul says, I'm straining for the prize. I've got my eyes on the prize. Friends, we need to remember to keep our eyes on the prize. And we do it by keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. He kept his eyes fixed on the prize for him, which was us. Hebrews says it was the, for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. He ran after us, friends. He ran after us and it, he allowed it to cost him. It had to cost him. The cross cost him because of us. He kept his eyes on the prize, which was his reward of a family to be with him for eternity in heaven. We are his prize. Is he our prize? And are we keeping our eyes on the prize? Paul made it completely clear in this passage he makes it completely clear that there's one ambition at the top of all the others in his list and that ambition is to know Jesus better to know his love to know his power to know his life so that ultimately he could know life in eternity the resurrection life when he dies friends I want to encourage us this week let's ask ourselves that question what ambition is top of our list what ambition is at the top do we need a reset Jesus is merciful he's kind his Holy Spirit wants to help us if we want to stoke that fire he's the one that will stoke it with us but let's be honest with ourselves and with him this week and let's invite us to show him what's top of our list and if it's not him how to move him back to the top Thanks, Hills. 